Hello and a very warm welcome to this week's edition of The Real Talk. My name is Jackie Lumbasi. Our guest today is a tall, light-skinned man. If you've been to the BK Arena for an event, you must have seen a guy tall, he stands out of the crowd, tall, very light, wears spectacles, he moves around to make sure that everything is in order. His name is Carl Scofield. That's our guest today. He is the co-founder of QA Venues Solutions. You will find out who they are. Kyle, it is a pleasure to have you here with us. Absolutely. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And, uh, you know, just watching you introduce yourself. <laughs> I must admit, I've seen you on radio. I see you now on live TV. You're an absolute world class at, <laughs> at what you do. So uh, I'm humbled. <laughs> yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank to you be so here. much. Thank yeah. you, Kyle. I, I try my best. Yeah. Awesome. How's it going? How's everything? Everything is good. Mm. Everything is good. You know, we, we are in season. Uh, oh man, you know, this is yeah. your season. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are wondering, so his season, yeah. when Kyle says it is their season, yeah. so Kyle, as the co founder of QA Venue Solutions, manages the BK Arena. And indeed, you know the BK Arena and what that iconic place has done to the story of our country. You'll get to hear more about yeah. it. Yeah. Uh -huh. So this is the season. This is the season. You know, it's. Uh, <laughs> It's interesting how across the across the world seasons differ, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it uh, you know it of course plays in with weather and so on. But you know we're in Rwanda; it's almost three years now. Uh, literally, eleventh of October is three yeah. years in Rwanda, um, and it's it's amazing to see the seasons, yeah. uh, and it's amazing to see how different aspects ha can alter seasons, um, and we we experience a very low period during the beginning of the year mm -hmm. uh, we have a mission now to try and figure out how do you you know bring that from jan to feb to march how do you bring it up yeah. you know, and, and that has happened for time? the last three years yeah exactly john feb march it was a bit quiet, mm. and then from may is, yeah man no. it's a different story <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Kyle, tell us about exciting. yourself. Where yeah. are you from? Yeah, Who yeah. is this wonderful man yeah. seated in front of us? Awesome. Look, I, I, I really try my best to just stick to the business as much as I can. I'm a you know, very private individual. Uh, I keep it... Uh, you think I don't know that? Yeah, I keep it low-key. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, I, yeah. I'm, I'm originally from... I'm South African. Yeah. Right? Um, originally from South Africa, I grew up in Swaziland, very small country, and I think that's also why Rwanda really resonates with me is just that community aspect um, yeah. and how you know it's it's I don't want to say it's easy, but it's it's really unique in being able to get into the flow of things, and that's because everyone is so close together that. Yeah. You know, we have a similar objective and we want to move forward. And, and, and that takes me back to where I grew up in, in, in Swaziland, you know, because we all, we are a very tight community. We all had the same objective and we move forward. Um, so I grew up in Swaziland for, for a lot of my adolescent years. Um, it's probably the best uh, period of my life in terms of just shaping my character. You know, we... We grew up in, in the middle of a sugarcane field, uh, to be honest. Sugarcane uh, field? Yeah. Were your parents sugarcane farmers? No, no, no. Um, it just so happened that, uh, so my mother's uh, father was a quantity surveyor. Um, he worked with the sugar mill. Um, I did a lot of their plotting and planning. Uh, my, my, my father was a, an avid uh, business uh, person. And it just so happened that his work took him to Swaziland, and he met my mother during that uh, during that period. Um, and I think it was it was acknowledging the fact that it was a really great place to to grow your your kids. Yeah. And so for my adolescent years, we were there. Um, my father was was really in and out of uh, you know the, doing work in South Africa. He'd be back every now and then. But it provided the opportunity for us to get out. You know, we, we could literally leave the house at seven in the morning and come back at six in the evening. 
Uh, there wasn't a worry about what was happening. You know, it was safe. It was a good community, like I said. Uh, but as a kid, it, it, it grows you because for a lot of the day, you're on your own. You know, mm. you're with your friends. You, you're going through challenges and, and things that are happening that, that force you to get your mind into a space on how do I create solutions? You know, mm. if we've got a challenge, what do I do? Uh, you can't just turn to your parents the whole time and say, okay, this is my challenge, what do I do? Mm. So it shaped a lot of who I am, I, I firmly believe. And, and I think, you know, for even myself now, I've, I've, I've got my own kids. Yeah. Uh, How many kids do you have? I've got three, oh, three kids. Okay. Mm. A very unique story, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> oh, you've got to tell me that story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it was a great space to grow up. Mm. We eventually moved over into Johannesburg and, you know, that was big city life. There, there's something very special about going from a small village, to very small, city. to big city. Uh, it, it, like, it, it puts a challenge in front of you, mm. right? Because in a small city, you are known, you're recognized. The minute you step into a big city, you're just a number, yeah. you know? And it, it, it creates that challenge, it creates that like, desire to, to also be recognized. Um, and with that brings just this natural drive for constant hard yeah, work exactly mm. exactly uh, so that transition was great i did a lot of my high schooling there um, and moved into working career um, and from that point then worked throughout the continent you know yeah. I've, I've traveled the continent extensively um, wow. uh, at this point i think i probably sit on uh, between 30 and 33 countries that I've, oh. I've been into on the continent. The continent. So, yeah. That's amazing. And so so I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Africa person. You uh, are 100%, yeah. Percent, yeah? I'm, mm. uh, I say I'm a, I'm a pan-Africanist. Yeah. yeah. What was it like going to school in Swaziland and then uh, moving away from Swaziland to yeah. Jobak? Did yeah. that, was there some interruption or was it the yeah. same yeah. Uh, education system, the yeah. same yeah. curriculum? And then what did you want to become mm. eventually mm. and did you get there? So um, the transition from Swaziland to, to South Africa, just from like an education perspective, wasn't mm. much of a change. Okay. Swaziland is, is, is very linked to how so South Africa operates, right? So that transition wasn't, wasn't too bad. Okay. But there were things that, that sort of hit you as you went into this transition, is that in Swaziland, we weren't familiar with things like race and so on, right? In South Africa, you know, at the time we moved up, we're still, there were still lingering aspects of you know, what was the apartheid and so on. And, and so you got into the schooling environment, so you could still see distinction between people. And that for us was, we were like, hey, what's going on? You, know, in, you had never seen yeah, that. Yeah, in Swaziland, there was no distinction. Yeah. We are who we are. And you know, um, I, I as, as an individual, um, I come from what is called a, a colored family. Mm. Um, we are a product of uh, the colonizers, you know. Um, mm. and, and, yeah, that, for us, we were always just, uh, we, we were in the middle, if I could say. You know, yeah. we were always just like, guys, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who are we? Yeah, <laughs> when the whites <laughs> were told to stand up, you will not. When yeah, the blacks yeah, are told, yeah, you yeah, wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can we all just stand up, please? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Let's cut this short. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, so that was like the only glaring uh, mm. difference, um, aside from the fact that it was big city life, yeah. and, you know, and you had to fight a bit harder to 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 have oh. your position. Yeah. Um, we were avid sports. Both myself and my brother were avid sports people. Um, I I in Swaziland, along with my brother, we swam for the country at at very young ages. Uh, so moving up into into South Africa, that was like our thing. Like we were sports people, athletes. Yeah, exactly. But you get into this space, and you're like, okay, I thought I was a sports person. Oh man, uh, mm -mm. this is new league, you know. <laughs> yeah. So again, you get that, you learn that drive of like, okay, uh, I've I've got to do a lot more to be at the top, you know. Mm -hmm. And sports, uh, another thing that that has shaped me, and I'm also still technically in sports. Wow. You know, I've dealt a lot with sports and so on. Um, so I played uh, uh, professional water polo, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is like soccer it, and water. It's, it's, it's not our thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I've I understood think, how you place soccer in water. Oh. Yeah, it's great, but, but you do it with your hands. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a, a mind twister, to be honest. Yeah. But I, I, we were always swimmers. In Swaziland, oh. they had a very good culture of swimming. Um, and then also rugby. Yeah. You know, uh, that, was, that was our thing. Yeah. But those, those were like fundamental things that you know, sort of differed in that transition. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So then uh, your first job. Yeah. yeah. What was it? Um, again, very unique story. <laughs> um, a, a lot of these, these milestones are things that, again, shaped me as a person, right? Uh, when we moved up to South Africa, uh, we had a very unfortunate uh, situation in our family. Uh, it was probably six or eight months into living in South Africa. Uh, my father passed away. Oh. And that really hit us as a family, you mm. know, on all aspects. Um, Can we, were, we were in a completely new setting. We didn't know how to operate. So a lot of things, again, you know, shaped who I am. But it, it, it forced my mother, who at the time was just really at home and, and coordinating the household, to get into some of the business that was going on. Um, and one of them was a... A store in a shopping mall uh, mm -hmm. in South Africa and that was our, our first both myself and my brother we used to go after school you'd go there to if help we had time, mm. or the weekends mainly we would be there helping in the store okay and we were just basic sales and yeah. you know, coordinating the place and we were, we were young that's we always were 14, a good experience 15. to give to yeah. children yeah the best gives you great exposure the best the best, the best. yeah the best. You have your own children, yeah. three of them. And you said yes. there's a unique story to very that. Very unique, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Share it with yeah. us. Um, so a very unique story uh, because uh, I was in high school. Um, I had my high school sweetheart. <laughs> um, we were together for roughly about three to four years. And I think we just sort of transitioned from being high school people to now being in, in the world and trying to figure things out. So it didn't work out and we left each other. Uh, and we were silent for 10 years. We did not speak to each other for 10 years. Is it because you went to different uh, states, different cities? Yeah, we, we were in different cities and, you know, just had a lot of differences and we said, you know, so you cut communication? Communication completely. completely. And it, you knew each other's family, I presume? Um, not necessarily. Okay. Here and there. You know, we, 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 knew, we knew family here and there. But 10 years, not a word. Not a single word, right? Uh. And um, it was in 2019, decided... Well, I, I decided. I, I had a dream. This is how <laughs> unique this is. And, I, and for some reason, I dreamt about... Uh, Your high school, school sweetheart. But it was such a strong, a strong dream. I woke up the next day. I was like, I, I've got to figure out what's going on. Like, is, is she okay? Is everything all right? And oh. I reached out uh, through social media. And the message that came back, she said, that's so crazy that you messaged me. Because I had a dream about you last oh night. Oh, my goodness. And from so that divine. day, we, we just didn't stop speaking. Um, and within six months... We were back together. Um, wow. We decided to get married. She was pregnant with our twins. And nine months later, gave birth to our twins. And exactly a year after gave birth to the twins, gave birth to our son. Mm -hmm. That's how we have three kids. Oh, amazing. And the son was born in Kigali. In Kigali. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so was she part of the decision to move to yes, Rwanda? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now let's get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, everything is going on well. Yeah, yeah. And then um, you form a company yes, yes. with a, a, a partner of yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the story behind QA Venue yeah, Solutions? Yeah. So QA Venue Solutions, you know, as a, the, the business is set up to manage um, sports and entertainment venues mm. across the continent, right? And the backstory behind it is... I, I went into the working career, you know, I had my first few jobs that mm. sort of gave me an understanding of the world. Um, I, I came from a very entrepreneurial family. Mm. And so the first thing I did when I was able to is I registered a company and I started just basic trading, 
you know, and, and trying to get myself into the entrepreneurial space. Uh, at a very young age, I had accumulated some money, and at the same time, I had lost everything that I had. Oh. And this was just from being very uh, new to the business environment, uh, not understanding certain aspects, but I learned a lot through the process. Mm. And during that period of, of the sort of down uh, turn, I, I went and I contracted for an agency that was focused on sports uh, because I had a good understanding of sports. Mm -hmm. I had this business acumen that I was building. Um, and one of the projects... And the that, business was also in line yes, with sports, okay. With, with sports. I, I was, I've always been in sports in oh. some way, shape or form. Always. Wow. Um, and the agency that I was contra contracting with at the time had the NBA as a client. Hmm. And the NBA had just come into Africa. They were brand new on the continent. Um, I, I remember there's always a story that uh, who's now become a good friend of mine, Amadou tells, mm. and he tells the story that when he did the first press conference on launching NBA in Africa, one of the questions that came through was like, oh, is this netball? <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. So, so it was like yeah. really at the Not beginning basketball. Stages. Yeah, this is basketball. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I could see in the agency, I mean, I didn't have a good, really strong understanding of basketball, but I had an understanding of sport. Um, and I could see in the agency that the account, because it was so new, they weren't sure if they were going to spend a lot of money on the continent or not. Because it was so new, a lot of people sort of treated it as this is an account we'll deal with, mm -hmm. as and when things come about. Um, and my approach was different. I said, give me the account yeah. and I'll run it. You don't have to pay me for it. Oh. I just, it's a big brand. I want to see what it's all about. You wanted to learn yes, everything I, there was I, I about get it. Into it. And I took that on. Um, and in the, in the time that I was, I was doing that, you know, grew with them into multiple countries on the continent. Yeah. Um, and they then approached me uh, because the position had opened up within the NBA to lead the event division for the continent. And I just couldn't, I couldn't say no. So I joined the, 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 the NBA. I worked with them for a couple of years. Oh. Uh, grew their, their, their eventing business across the continent into various countries. Like I said, you know, up in the region of 30 countries. Uh, had a really, really good understanding of the continent, the, the dynamic of the continent. But at the same time, I was also doing a lot of the all-star events in the U.S., I was doing some of the global games in London, in Spain. Uh, so I had a, a, a really, really good front row seat on how these arenas in, in markets where things are so much more established were being operated and were being commercialized. And the more I came back into the continent, it, it became very clear that this growth of NBA and some of the sporting institutions as well that continued growth at some point would need venues to be able to grow their business. Yeah. And that idea started brewing in my head on how do, I, how do I go back to being the business person that I've always wanted to be um, and do something that is greater than myself. Because when we look at the business, yes, there's, there's a straight business element of generating revenue and so on, but the impact factor for me, it was the biggest pull when, when I said to myself, I was going to leave a position that a lot of people would be like, oh, would, you're, would you're do anything to yeah. get. Yes, exactly. I'm sure you were the envy of I, a lot of people. Yeah, I was, I was a very, very young guy yeah. with a very high level position um, that had exposure to the world. <laughs> and I decided that, you know, this, this, Ability to go out and make a change on a continent yeah. that I love so much is something that I had to do. And so I had met up with who is now my business partner, Mark yeah. Ransom. He's been in the business for 40, 40 odd years, oh. uh, has a really good understanding of, of the venue space, has dealt with it quite a bit. Um, and I put the, the, the opportunity in front of him. I said, look, I've built my networks across the continent. Um, do you want to come together and we form a business to go and, and, and do this across the continent? We, as a matter of fact, we actually took his initial business uh, at the time was called QA Entertainment Technology 
solutions. Uh -huh. So he focused uh, uh, like really on the tech side of the venues uh, when it comes to lighting, sound, and so on. Okay. So we, we, we took the QA part of it and we formulated QA venue solutions mm -hmm. to then go across the continent and bring in this professional management solution to oh. commercialize and manage uh, venues, venues like BK Arena. Yeah. To make sure, because a serious issue that we had on the continent, and I, I saw this firsthand, was the fact that venues were being built by the governments and they didn't have a long-term strategy and it became a yeah. cost to the government and very quickly it became a white elephant where nothing would happen. It, it, it's, it becomes an eyesore in the country. Um, and that's something that we wanted to change because we knew that if we could get it right, the thousands of lives that it impacts and the economy that it generates is something big. Yeah. And it, it's untapped in Africa. Absolutely. And that's yeah. the impact that yeah. you're looking yes. for. Yes. Yes. Amazing. We will be back shortly. We're talking to Kyle Scorfield, who's the co-founder of QA Venue Solutions. He's got quite a beautiful story. You've heard a little bit about himself and now him uh, talking about how he came together with his partner to, to start QA Venue Solutions. When we come back, we'll ask about the milestones and other achievements that there is to celebrate since Kyle and his team have been managing the BK Arena. This is The Real Talk, coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiev. Thank you so much for joining us on The Real Talk. My name is Jackie Lumbasi. Our guest is Kyle Scofield. He's a co-founder of QA Venue Solutions, a person that helps keep BK Arena in shape. Kyle, let's come to that part. So, yeah. you know, you've started the business and you're yeah. looking around the continent and there's lots of white elephants. Yeah. How did you zero in on Rwanda? On Rwanda? Yeah. It's a, it's a interesting one, and I think a lot of factors around the world brought us to where we are. Okay. Um, you know, at the same time where Rwanda was developing the, at the time, Kigali Arena, um, Senegal had completed their Dakar Arena. Mm -hmm. And if anyone knows, the two venues are identical. Okay. Dakar Arena. I haven't is, seen the Dakar. Dakar Arena is just got, I think it's got 5,000 more seats. That's it. Yeah. But it's the same company that built the two uh, arenas. Identical. I can literally walk into the door, close my eyes. <laughs> and you and know walk where the roof. offices yes, are. Yes, exactly. That, <laughs> okay. that, that, that's how similar they are. Mm. So. At the time, we, we were also engaged with the government of Senegal on managing the venue. Um, there was a few other projects that were, you know, just sort of moving along. Um, and then COVID hit. COVID came in and completely shut down the entire industry. Entire industry. Yeah. Uh, as a business, we literally had just formed... <coughs> Literally, had just yes. um, And I think as a family, you had literally yeah, just yeah. moved here. Uh, we hadn't even moved here. Oh. But at the time, company had just been formed. Yes, there was opportunities, which all went radio silent. Um, I had the news of, of my twins coming. Uh, yeah. uh, I had just parted ways with the NBA. You know, I was in a very comfortable position. Um, and yeah, I was sitting and saying, okay, well, what happens, you know? Yeah. At the time, everyone thought it would be three weeks and everything would be done. You know, South Africa shut down for the, the initial lockdown. They said 21 days and then we open up again. So for us, it was like, okay, we can ride out 21 days. That's yeah. fine. Mm -hmm. We'll get back into work. And we didn't know it was going to be yeah, almost right. two, years, two years, right? Yeah. Um, but at, at the time, the only country, only government that said, we are going to continue our process is Rwanda. Mm -hmm. We literally went back to drawing board. We sat, we went through all the nuances of formulating the agreements and all that sort of stuff. And, and for us, that was a big eye opener. 
and we said to ourselves, you know, the, the important thing for our business is also aligning with governments that see the opportunity of what we are trying to do. Yeah. Um, it also informed our decision, both myself and, you know, my business partner of actually moving to Rwanda uh, because we could see, you know, it was, it was very difficult with the whole COVID situation going on to actually identify if things were going to end soon, if they weren't going to end soon. Mm. But we appreciated the fact that the government of Rwanda, regardless of what that indicator was, they were finding ways on how do we get our markets back up and running. Yeah. Um, and we said to ourselves, let's go into Rwanda, let's base ourselves there, and let's build business from that point, uh, because not only does it give us better access to the continent, but we know we have the government's support in moving out of whatever this industry was, uh, w w was going through at the time. Mm. Um, so for, for, for us, you know, that, that unique opportunity in, in getting the business up and running and, and getting into Rwanda was something that we couldn't pass on. And, and it played such a vital role in what we see today as BK Arena, as QA Venue Solutions yeah. and so on. Um, I, I remember, you know, going through the, the, the COVID period and South Africa got hit with the red list. Oh man. Where if, you're, if the country was on the red list, you basically couldn't travel anywhere. Yeah. And because we were in Rwanda, we weren't implicated by that. Every, every airport that I arrived in, they would pull me aside because of my South African passport. Mm. But at least I was above this red list and I could actually conduct business. I could continue with my work and keep moving. And mm. So, a lot of unique stories. Saved you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why we're here. That's why we're here. I wonder how, how easy was it to convince your partner, your wife, that... We're going to make this yes. move, and at yes. this time where there's a lot of uncertainty, yes, still yes. I would love you to trust me and come along. You know, I, I think we, we, we had a lot of learnings from our initial relationship, and we sort of came back together on the basis that if we were going to do this, we had to do it on our terms, and we had to do it based on whatever would make us as a partnership a success, right? Mm. Because these, these sort of relationships, and, and it's something that we took on and we feel very strongly about, is that your relationship is not something that just survives off fresh air and, and <laughs> love and, you know, all these uh, movie things that, that come dates. along. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's about hard work. It's about yeah. dedication to the process. And it's, it's also about creating your own way. Right, mm. and if you stick to that, and you're not influenced by everyone's decision, because there's no universal formula. Hundred yeah. percent. Everyone yeah. has their Just make opinion. It work for you. Mm. Exactly. So, because mm. we set our foundation on that basis, mm. these decisions were simple. It wasn't a long thought out process. It wasn't yeah. any. Wow. It was simple. This is what we have to do, and we're going to do it. Yeah. Um, now, for us, when the move happened. Um, it wasn't when I moved up. I moved up in October, uh, three years ago. Uh, moved up into Rwanda. I came up to sort of just figure out what's the ins and outs and see how we can we can bring the family in. Okay. Uh, so yeah, for for the first three or four months of my twins' lives. Oh, you were not with them. I was not there, mm. uh, and so that was also just like that pressure point on saying, you know, how do we we need to be together, yeah. right? Uh, COVID just didn't help. Mm, it, it not was so was. difficult. But the decision? Yes. When I think back on it, uh, it wasn't even... You're happy with yeah, yourself. It wasn't even like, oh, we're making a decision. It was yeah. like, this is what we have to do. Yeah. And so we started off as Kigali Arena along mm -hmm. the way. Mm -hmm. uh, the name changed yes. to BK yes. Arena. Tell us yes. about the naming rights deal, deal. with the BK. Huge. Uh. Yeah, huge. <laughs> The continent had never seen anything like that. Nothing. Oh. Look, there, 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 there had been uh, some aspects of it. You know, I, I, I give credit to South Africa and, you know, some of the arenas in South Africa okay. have, had gone through name changes. But I, I don't think it was anything as significant as what we had done, okay. right? 
And till today, I think we still sit as the largest naming right deal on the continent, right? Wow. Um, in terms of value. And so that, that was huge, not only for the arena, but also for the business, right? Because we took this very sort of wild approach on saying we're going to go into the continent and we're going to bring this whole model of venue management yeah. to, to, to the continent. And so the risk was huge, right? Um, and the minute we got that done, it was a big message to the world, um, to partners in the US, partners in Europe, to say that these things are possible, right? Yeah. Now, if you look at the value in comparison to values that you see in the US, I mean, some of the naming right deals on the US are $800 million, $700 million. Yeah, we we a fraction compared to that. Mm. But if you look at the US, you know, when the whole arena thing started in the US, we are on par with that, which means the way we've started and the way we're going, mm. we, we'll, we'll get there. So we it, will, yeah. It was, it was massive. It was massive. Wow, yeah. incredible. Yeah. Um, and then the other question that I would love to ask is on sustainability. Mm -hmm. So here we are, mm -hmm. everything's moving well yeah. so far. We've yeah. got uh, grant partners, yes, amazing yes, people. Yes, yes. When it comes to sustainability, how mm -hmm. do you see yeah, yourselves yeah. doing business in the next 10 years yeah, yeah, and with yeah. the changing dynamics? Yes, yes. Look, I think, I think I'd also like to add the point of sustainability also from a commercialization uh, yeah. perspective. You know, uh, do, doing the... the the BK deal was very much in line with creating sustainability for these arenas. We spoke of arenas and stadiums becoming white elephants. Yeah. And in order to sustain them, you know, even in their most basic form, this commercialization is critical. And that's something that we really uh, hold ourselves accountable to in terms of protecting our partners, making sure our partners are at the forefront because they are the people that really sustain what is happening in the, uh, in the arena, aside from the events. So this is really the guys who decide to take those long, uh, you know, one, two, three year contracts with us that, that, that ensure we are able to sustain that building and keep it, you know, the same way that it was released in 2019. Mm -hmm. If anything, that building is in a better condition, you know, and that's because of these partners. But that then transitions into this new dynamic that we see in the world of sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, how are we doing better for the world, right? And I think if you look at QA Venue Solutions today, we also did a, uh, we, we made a bold step in taking over in Yandungu Eco Park. Yeah. And this was all hinged around sustainability because our, our viewpoint was if as a business, we can really get comfortable with how we keep spaces sustainable, how we make spaces green, how we protect ecosystems and communities and everything that's around it, then we are setting ourselves up as a business that will make it for the long run. Mm -hmm. Because in 10 years time, the whole world is going to be focused around sustainability. Yeah. If, if you're not building something that is, uh, is in line with sus uh, sustainability, you probably won't get approvals in 10, 20 years, right? Yeah, because true. at that stage, this whole concept that we are seeing, I believe is gonna be really in place. And so our approach on, on sustainability is very strong and we, we are actively trying to push it as a business. You know, we look at the arena as an example, we run a lot of internal processes, basic things like if you leave a room, you turn lights off as an mm -hmm. example because all of that plays into our sustainability. We're mm -hmm. working on a lot of projects to green, uh, sort of greenify the arena. Uh, yeah. You know, there's a lot of space in the arena for solar projects. There's a lot of um, opportunities to maybe better internal systems. Um, we do a really good job at um, recycling wastewater wow. um, on the site. Um, so all of those aspects is top of our agenda um, and I think, you know, like I said, taking over Nyandungu Eco Park is mm -hmm. testament to that. Yeah. Uh, our entire intention with the park is to make mm -hmm. sure that we can showcase a management model that can go across the continent as well. 
mm. that allows for spaces like that to be commercialized with the understanding that you've got to protect the ecosystem. Yeah. You've got to protect the environment. Exactly. Yeah. And so this business model, this venue management mm. model, yeah, it's yeah. been received very well in yeah. Rwanda, and you can tell that yeah. the government, you have the government's full support. 100%. How about elsewhere on the continent? You know, the, the, this is where, um, as a pan-Africanist, I must say that I stand firmly with Rwanda, and I support Rwanda 150%. I think the way the government has positioned this country is phenomenal. And what it does is it showcases a model for Africa, right? I think if we, if we could see a lot more governments taking on this approach, we could have a very different Africa. We'll go far, yeah? Yeah, we have a very different Africa. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of the, the uh, tactics that are, are being used in, in Rwanda influencing some of the other countries, you know, and it's, it's an amazing thing to see. We're seeing different leadership come in. We're seeing leaders that are coming in now and are being accountable yeah. and saying, you know, we, we are wealthy countries, but what's... What's there to show? What's going on around us, you know? Um, and so the, the, the model that we bring is, is being, is, is a lot more accepted across the continent. It's not a case of, hey, how can you come in, build something for us? We just want to achieve this objective thing. <laughs> the, the conversations are now, okay, we want to build this, but we want it to survive. For the next for six the next, years. Uh, exactly. Yes. So I think, I, I think our, our understanding of Africa is, is helping us a lot. Wow. You know? And, and uh, like I said, I was extremely fortunate to go across mm. all these countries in Africa. And... There's a simple dynamic on the continent that if you understand, mm. you have a real grasp of Africa. And that's the fact that I'm in Rwanda now. And if I just step over the border into Burundi, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, any of the country, it's a completely different ballgame. <laughs> completely different. Mm. Every country is unique in its own way and has its own way of operating. And so what you experience on the east of Africa is different to the west and is different to the north, different to the south. Okay. And the minute you are able to conceptualize that and adapt to it, you've got a venue management model that can integrate into communities. Mm. And that for us is something that we hold as a, a, a product, as QA Venue Solutions, is mm. that everybody on the team, mm. everybody is aligned with the fact that we get into spaces, but it's not there to say this is how it's done mm -mm. is to say how can we partner to get this done yeah That's and you appreciate the uniqueness 100%. that every one of, the, of these countries will 100%. come with yeah and so are there any significant partnerships that are in the offing things yeah. in the near future that yeah. you're working yeah. on yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah look i think i think we we are fully out of COVID at the moment yeah. um we're seeing a lot of countries now you know getting back into uh, I like to say sort of stretching their legs. They want to <laughs> they want to get moving again. Um, so there's there's a lot of conversations happening at the moment. We've got some very interesting uh, opportunities coming up in Benin. So oh. we're, we're, we're traveling up and down to Benin at the moment. Uh, Kenya. Oh. Kenya is one that I, I, I think very soon we'll see something come up. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's seen the news, but mm. Uganda is also... Um, you know, talking about it's the arena now, they want, yes. to, they, they want to get up and running. Um, but We've got an inspired. A hundred percent. But for us as a business, uh, in terms of partnerships at the moment, I'm not sure, again, on the mm. news, we just launched the hotel project, uh, mm -hmm. Zaria Court, which is yes. right next to the arena. To the arena, yeah. That, that, that is, sounds like an amazing uh, thing. Amazing. It's a, Amazing. It'll be like a city within a city, exactly. yeah? Exactly. And that, that's mm. our vision for the continent, is that oh. where you have these sporting facilities, you can create a city. Mm. Uh, because it, you almost become like an anchor tenant. You're mm. pulling people into one space. Mm. You can create an economic uh, system out of that. So that is a, a very uh, exciting partnership for us. Mm. Uh, we are officially partners with the, 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 the Zaria um, 
Zoria core team, we're working together to figure out how we go and expand across the continent mm. and bring this uh, city, as you call it, yeah. uh, into different spaces. Because the minute you do that, you will activate the sports and entertainment mm. eco economy. Yeah. That's, that's what we want. You know, I lo and I love that as an individual, yeah. you chose sports as something you would cherish for life and the line within which you'd work. Because it's been said, there's nothing that unites people like yeah. sports. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We've, we've seen it uh, Absolutely. across the globe. Absolutely. Okay, before we get into six cues, uh, yeah. fill us in on yeah. uh, the few exciting upcoming events yeah. that you have yeah, yeah, yeah. for the remaining months. Yes, yes, mm. yes. yes. Um, Okay, I hope everyone's listening. Right? <laughs> Pay attention, please. <laughs> um, yeah, so we, we, uh, this weekend, uh, um, we have the Africa Throne Tour, which is partnered with Fawaba. Um, mm -hmm. You know, these are artists from our home, home country, uh, Nasty C and Casper yeah. uh, and your vest. Very excited about it. Um, I think if anyone wants to come and see the nexus between sports and entertainment, which is really a, it's something that we need to enhance and, and really protect on the continent because that can be a, bi a big thing for us. But that mix between sports and entertainment this weekend, make sure it's happening. It's gonna be a great event. Um, the, the next is of course, Boys to Men. Yes. Boys to men. That speaks to my generation. Yes. <laughs> now, th this for us, uh, we want to make yeah. this an annual thing. Oh. We, we want to create a, a date in the calendar where people know that we are bringing, you know, artists from that generation that just... Yeah. I, I think there's so many people's lives that have been shaped around this music. Mm. You know, the impact that this music has had, be it in their... Uh, relationships or themselves personally. Or Talk about relationships. We used to write each other letters exactly. and we'd find the lyrics. Exactly. I dedicate you this song yes. and you pick up a <laughs> stanza. Exactly. You yeah. know? So, so, so we are wow. extremely excited. We've taken a big risk on bringing the, the mm. Boyz II Men team out here. Uh, what we want to do with it is also showcase that, guys, we can do it. Like, let's, yeah. let's bring more of this top end entertainment into uh, Kigali. We can do uh, it. We can absolutely do it, right? Yeah. So that we're very excited about. We've got Trace um, mm -hmm. coming Trace up Trace and well. coming up, yeah. That's gonna be a big one. Um, mm. And then we go into the end of the year, and this is, this is the, the, the local promoters mm. just take it away. You know, yeah. they, they, they come in, we've got so many discussions around events for November, December, uh, that we're extremely excited about. Some that are coming back from previous years. Mm. Um, so we, we're very excited about the end of the year. It's three years now that we've been yeah. engaging with the promoters. So we, we got a good sense of how we need to work with each other now. And Great. we're excited for, for this year. Yeah. I, I think we're gonna, we, Rwanda is gonna be, it's gonna be shaking for no, sure. Absolutely. Uh, and often people complain that the ticket prices are high, but I know yeah, there's a, yeah. a card yes, that yes. they could purchase, yes, which yes. please tell us about that card. Yes. And then we get to six cues. Uh, exactly. So, <laughs> so, um, so that we don't have people missing out on boys uh, to men, uh, on the saying the ticket is expensive. No. Yes, yes. Oh. So, so we have the, the BK Arena card, mm. which is a product of our partnership with BK. Um, it, it's, I, I like to call it your access mm -hmm. to everything, right? The benefits that come off that card, are, and we're continuously trying to push more and more benefits. A lot of it at the arena, but we're also spreading out into the city. You know, we, we've been to a couple of locations across the city where yeah. we're doing a lot of giveaways and there's benefits through the card and so on. But, but also when it comes to these events, especially like Boys to Men as an example, with that card, you're getting 30% off whatever ticket you buy. Yeah. That's a huge discount. That's huge. You know, Not huge doubt. discount. So, mm. um, yeah, if anyone doesn't have the card, oh. you've you, you got to get it. <laughs> Do not say you are not told. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so go to any, any BK branch and get the yes. card. This is The Real Talk on RTV. Thank you for joining us. Use the hashtag to ask any questions. Give us comments and even suggest if there's anyone you want to see on the show, please let us know. We're coming to you from Mythos Boutique Hotel in Kiovu.
how six cues, yeah. this one will rush through. What is the yeah. best career advice that you have received? Uh, best career advice is, is really have a tough skin. That's probably <laughs> been my best career advice. So tough that even COVID will not deter you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Is have a tough skin because wow. I think I, I think a lot of people don't like doing hard things, mm -hmm. and it's only doing hard things that gets you to the next level. Yeah. But you got to have a tough skin for that. Yeah. What is the best childhood memory that you have? Best childhood memory. You know, when you say that, my mind immediately goes to one thing. Uh. Um, like I said, I never used to see my father much, uh. but he had always come back and we always drive up to to Johannesburg from Swaziland. And it was in the moments of sitting in the back of the car. I'm a big Simply Red fan because of this. Oh. I listen to Simply Red all the time. Yeah. It was my father's favorite, favorite music. <laughs> and yeah. he used to, we used to be driving with the rain, hitting the roof of the car and the music playing. Oh. And it was just, that for me is, is always something I cherish because wow. it, 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 it really, I think it helped me become more of a thinker, a strategic thinker because I would always just spend time with myself in that moment. You know? mm. So I, I enjoyed that. Okay, that was precious. What do you do when you're not at work? I play golf. Oh. I'm joking. I yeah. spend time with my family. <laughs> <laughs> so is it golf and your family? <laughs> okay. And then what is that thing that people do not know about Kai? Um, you know, I, I think my industry forces me to... To be an extrovert, mm. you know, out there always with people. I, I, I love my, my me time. Yeah. I'm an introvert, you know. I, yeah. I, like, I like my time. I like to be on my own. I like to think about things. If you had your way, you yeah. wouldn't be I'd sitting just, here with me. Yeah, I'd just be. <laughs> uh, I'm a thinker. Yeah. yeah. What has been the highlight of your time in Rwanda? I, I must say it's, it's closing on... The, the, there's a few. Closing mm. on the naming rights deal with BK. Um, that was big. That was huge. It, it, it was a real stamp of approval for whatever we were doing. Um, of course, my family moving up. Uh, you know, I think in terms of support structures, uh, you know, I have to give credit to my wife. I would never be here without my wife. So wow. having her here in Rwanda, us just creating a whole new world has is, is, is been extremely special. Um, and then the people. Mm -hmm. uh, the people of Rwanda, I think, just given how everybody is locked into the same vision and the same, you know, we, we are going to be the best we can possibly be. Yeah. Nothing can beat that. That's admirable. Yeah, yeah. Nothing can beat yeah. And lastly, what advice would you give to someone who has intentions of venturing into mm -hmm. events and venue mm -hmm. management? Mm -hmm. um, just, just start. Whatever it is. Even if you're not getting paid for it. Start. Just start. Just start. Even if you're just an usher, you know, whatever it is. Mm. Just start because... The, you don't know what you want and what you're doing until you do it, mm -hmm. right? Because the world will present so many things to you. You might even look at it and say, actually, I don't want to be here. I want to be there, mm. you know? Um, and that's the fortunate part about our industry is that we interact with so many different things. You get exposed to so many different things that if you just start, if you get up and do it, have the right attitude, you know, don't, don't be in a space because you're not getting paid for it. Now you're doing half the job. Yeah. You do it to your max, the world will recognize you. Mm. you know? What you give in is what you get out. Yeah. I like yeah. to say someone is always watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Kyle, it's been such a pleasure sitting here with you. Thank That's you so much for giving us time. <laughs> and we do wish you all the best yeah. and wish to see you again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, it's always a pleasure, you know. Thank like you, Like I Kyle. said, radio, yeah. we're now live on TV. You know. Life is good, man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And awesome. thank you for always saying yes to me. Anytime. Yeah. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have Kyle with us. Kyle Schofield, the co-founder of QA Venue Solutions. You should follow them on their different social media platforms. You want to interact with them. You want to ask questions. You want to partner in any way. You want to 
uh, have an event at the BK Arena, go to them. The doors are always wide open. Yeah. You will find one. You'll find someone there yeah. who will give you all the information. Thank exactly. you for being part of the show, Thank and you. we do look forward to seeing you again next week. God bless you. <laughs>